in this place. I need y'all to pray with me because I woke up yesterday and all I could do was whisper. And I said, that never happens to me until it's time for me to sing and, and, and give God glory, but that means the devil's trying. That means something's supposed to happen tonight. This world is not my home. Oh, I'm just passing through. My treasures, they're all stored up. Oh, somewhere beyond the blue. The angel, they beckon me. Oh, from heaven, some heaven's open door. Oh, 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 I can't, can't feel at home in this world anymore. Can anybody else say that this afternoon? Oh, say, oh, Lord, Lord, you know that I have no friend like you. If heaven is not my home, tell me what. Shall I do the angel they beckon me hey, from heaven's um, heaven's open door? Oh, 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 I can't, I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Listen, oh, said I've got my granddaddy. He's just so over in glory lane And I don't, I don't expect to stop Till I shake, I shake his head He's waiting there for me Oh, at heaven's, heaven's open door Oh, I can't, I can't feel at home Oh, I said, I can't, I can't feel at home. Can y'all say that with me? Oh, I can't, I can't feel at home. Oh, I said, I can't, I can't feel at home. Oh, I said, they're killing, I can't feel at home. Oh, they're robbing and stealing, I can't feel at home. Too much hatred, I I can't feel at home. I can't. I can't feel at home. Listen, but I'm not worried. I can't feel at home. I've got a home in glory. I can't feel at home. Say it one more time. Oh, said I can't. I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Bless your name, Lord. Uh, I, got a, I got a song that I sing every chance that I get. And I, uh, my pastor's here, and I think I'm going to go ahead and sing it. Uh, he's, he's, he's told me he liked this song. When y'all catch on to it, I want y'all to help me out because I'm struggling this evening. Listen. I want to go where the thunder don't roar. There where chilly winds don't blow. I want to go where the rain don't pour. When I leave this world to return. Let me say it again. I just want to go where the rest don't roar. There where chilly winds don't blow. I want to go where the rain don't pour. When I leave this world to return on my Listen. 
down here below, there's nothing but pain and woe. When this life is over, to glory I want to go. I want to see the creator of you and me. Way up in heaven, it's where I want to be. I just, I just want to go where the thunder don't roll. There where, there where chilly winds don't blow. I just want to go where the rain don't pour. When I leave this world, y'all got it, to return. Let's say it again. I just want to go, I want to go where the thunder don't roar. There where chilly winds don't blow. I just want to go, I want to go. When I leave this world to return on my, listen, uh, I want to go where there's peace and harmony, where little children ain't afraid to walk the streets. I want to go where there's joy and peace of mind, over in that land where there be no more doubt. I just want to go. Where the thunder don't roar, there where chilly winds don't blow. I just want to go where the rain don't pour. Oh, when I leave this world to return on my, say that one more time. I want to go I want where the thunder don't roar, there where chilly winds don't blow. I just want to go, I want to go, yeah, where the rain don't pour. When I leave this world to return on, when I leave this world to return on, every day will be Sunday to return on, Sabbath will have no end to return on. I've got loved ones waiting on me to return no more. I want to see all my friends to return no more. I'm going to see my Savior, see him face to face. I'm going to tell him thank you, yes I am, for his amazing grace. Oh, when I leave this world to return no more. Say it one more time. To return no more. God bless y'all. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Is the Lord good? Bless the Lord, oh my soul. All that is within me, bless his holy name. It sure is good to see you all here tonight. Amen. We come to praise the Lord uh, this last night of our, uh, of our revival. And uh, we thank you for celebrating with us. Amen. And uh, we give honor to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Who is the head of this house and the head of our lives. Amen. So uh, we thank all of the participants uh, tonight. Um, we want to thank uh, Reverend Newman and the Newmans. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. They have blessed us. Amen. Uh, with their musical talents. And we thank the Lord for each of you. I thank the Lord for our worship leader, Pastor Lonnie Lord. And, uh, and, uh, I'm, I'm not going to hold us long, hold us up because, uh, it's, Amen. I, I don't have, you know, I got to go to work tomorrow, but uh, it, it doesn't matter because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm used to staying up all night anyway. <laughs> amen. But uh, I want to get you all out of here on time. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, I want to thank uh, uh, our, uh, Mount Nebo Baptist Church, who is the host uh, this, this, um, 
of this month, and we thank each of you for all the work that you have done to make things possible and to invite all of our friends and loved ones in here uh, tonight. Amen. I want to thank uh, Noria because she's been here on every Tuesday night. Amen. Amen. She has, she has served us, and we, we thank you so much. And God bless all of you. Amen. I'm cut. I'm cut, get, be off of short, Be short here. Um, we want to uh, thank uh, our uh, ministry. Uh, this uh, who have uh, blessed us with uh, the works that they have done to uh, get every pull everything together to um, that well, we will be uh, blessed uh, with all that they had did to help uh, to bring the spirit of the Lord in and in the uh, devotions and the order of service amen we thank each of you so very much um, now, I want to thank uh, all our pastor's wives in here that are present. Amen. Sister Van's here. Amen. She's one of us, of course. Amen. Uh, Sister Joy. Amen. Sister Conchita. Amen. Sister Beverly Jones. Amen. And uh, let me see. Uh, did I miss anyone? Except for, uh, hold on, uh, I got I got a sister Deidre uh, White, amen. We'll hear a word from her, amen. <laughs> and uh, amen. We'll, we'll, uh... Good evening, Pastor. Good evening, Church. How are you? Good evening. First, giving honor to God. First, giving honor to the Holy Trinity. Um, I guess it says that you should always be ready, right, to, to, to speak unto the Lord. And I'm just, just happy to be here. Um, a little nervous because I'm not the person that be up front, but I, I try to thank God and let him know that I love him. So I'm going to let you all know that I love you all. Thank you all for allowing us to come. We felt welcome. And I'm just looking for that word of God. Amen. 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 Praise God. But of course, uh, Sister Joanne Smith, uh, uh, the lady here at Mount Nebo. Amen. Uh, we're glad to have with us uh, these other brethren, friends of mine. Amen. Uh, Pastor uh, Reverend Doc Shorts, Pastor Philip Lewis, and uh, Pastor Jesse Jones, and Pastor Leroy Stewart. Amen. God bless you. Uh, now we'll have uh, Jess, Pastor Jesse Jones. Amen. Uh, Pastor Vinny Holland. Amen. Uh, Je Brother, Pastor Jesse Jones will speak. Bless the Lord, O my soul. <laughs> All with me, bless his holy name. Amen. Always good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. You know, I remember when people kept saying, hey, when you get old, driving at night is hard to see. And uh, uh, my wife says, uh, you going? And I said, yeah, I'm, go I'm going. He said, no, you can't see. <laughs> Amen. But we got all you folk praying for us tonight. And we'll get all the way back over the way. Amen. Good to be in God's house. Amen. I, I just know God takes care of us every time we go. If I can go up to Woodville, amen, at night, hey, I can make it to Marshall. God bless you. Uh, enjoy the service. I'm waiting for... Pastor White. Amen. Again, we thank each of you for uh, sharing with us this evening. Now, uh, the preacher of the hour, a uh, friend, a brother, beloved, and, uh, and uh, he's been a friend for a long time. And uh, through sickness, through hurt and pain, yet God has brought him through. And we are here tonight, amen, to be blessed by the the word of God coming from this man of God. Amen. So Brother Newman, stir us up. Uh, amen. And our uh, and, uh, next voice that we will hear will be the Brother Reverend Larry White from the Oakshade Baptist Church amen. in Catholic, Virginia. Amen. <laughs>
I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. Y'all can sing it with me. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Say that one more time. Huh? I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided I'm going to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, listen, no turning back, listen, though none go with me, still I will follow, listen, if I gotta go on by myself, still I'm gonna follow, Though none go with me, still I will follow, no turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided I'm going to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. I got one more verse. Listen. The world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, but the cross is before me, the world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. Anybody else decided they're going to stick with Jesus tonight? I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. Listen, no turning back, no turning back, no turning back, no turning back. No no turning back, no turning back. <laughs> nothing for oh, the Lord on my side tell me where would I be can anybody have that testimony where would I be if it had 
Oh Lord, Lord on my side, somebody tell me, would I be, oh I want to know, where would I be? When hard times came, he kept my enemies away and let the sun shine through my cloudy day. Oh, he rocked me in the cradle of his arms when he knew I'd been battered and scorned. Oh, if it had, had not been for the Lord. On my side, tell me where would I be? Where would I be? And the church said, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So grateful tonight to, to be with you. I am thanking the Lord for just another opportunity to be found in his house. And as so many of my brother and sister have come and said, Lord, we thank you just for another day. Amen. Amen. I always tell people that if the Lord wakes you up in the morning, that means he has a purpose for your life this day. So do what you can for him this day. Amen. All praise, honor, glorification, multiplication, and magnification of our true God. The one God who exists in three co-equal, eternal, and substantive persons. We thank God again, too, for this pastor, my friend. Amen. Matter of fact, when he, we came up here for Hurricane Katrina, he was the first preacher we met, him and Sister Joanne. Amen. And I ain't been able to get rid of neither one of them since. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and, of course, thanking the Lord for all these, my preaching brethren who are here with me today, my pastor, Pastor Jesse Jones, and these other preaching uh, great preaching men, amen. I, I, I look up to them, and I listen for their voice, and I watch them. So if I'm preaching, and I pause or stop, it's because somebody made an eye at me or something over there, and I may not be saying something right, but be that as it, as it may, I am grateful again to see each and every one of you here tonight. Now, I know that this is Tuesday night. We don't want to be long. We haven't gotten to Wednesday for those of us that work. But I'm going to do my best uh, to preach as long as I can. Amen. Because Pastor uh, Rocket said, just go for it. Just go for it. Amen. But uh, more seriously, we, we, we're going to examine the scriptures tonight. And I just pray that something will be said, something will be shared to inspire you, to open your heart, and above all, to give you the strength to continue pressing forward. Amen. After 148 years, somebody did something. Amen. And for the pastor to make 23 years, somebody did something. And we know who that somebody is. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, I don't present as an African-centric uh, preacher. My, my brother in, in Ohio, he, he preaches it. But I, I believe the gospel is for all men. I think Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. And that's everybody. We all are lost. But every now and then, we as black people should revisit or review what great things the Lord has done for us. Amen. It doesn't mean that we're better than white people or other people, but we know God has done something unique for us, and we ought to tell ourselves every now and then, but by the grace of God, yes, there go I. Amen. We are living through a traumatic inflection point in our American story. Millions of our fellow citizens are hurting from a series of pandemics, both physiological, psychological, and political. Our public health system, our economic faith, and issues of racial justice are all on the line at the very same time. And so too is democracy, our form of government. Observing the vicious murder of George Floyd on the streets of Minneapolis a few years ago was very disorienting for us as a black people. Then came the special elections in Georgia in January when on the eve of the insurrection at the U.S. Capitol, the Reverend Raphael Warnock, the pastor of Dr. King's church in Atlanta, became the first African-American ever sent to the Senate from his state and the 11th black American to be elevated to that chamber 
over all. This occurrence, among many others, is a powerful reminder of the vital role that the black church and its leaders, men and women, have always played at a pivotal moment in our collective struggle to realize a more perfect union. Black churches were the first institutions built by black people. We couldn't build houses. We didn't own land and farms. So we built a little rickety black church that we could peer through the floorboards and see the chickens underneath. And when it rained, some of y'all don't know what I'm talking about, but I'm from down south. I, I know what it was like in Mississippi, in Alabama, and Louisiana. And no pillar of the African-American community has ever been more central to its history, its identity, and social justice vision than the black church. To be sure, there's no single black church, just there's no single black religion. But the traditions and the faiths that fall under the umbrella of African-American religion, particularly Christianity, constitutes two stories for us. One of a people defining themselves in the presence of a higher power, God, and the other of their journey for freedom and equality in a land where power itself and even humanity for so long was denied to them. Yet the black church did not travel alone in its journey from an idea to a reality, for the church needed direction, it needed leadership, it needed a vision. Into a man sent from God, the black pastor. The black pastor and our preachers come a long way from circuit riding and preaching what he heard his white counterparts say, and preaching to small villages and hamlets, to attending seminaries, learning biblical languages, and being called to and founding from what we today call the mega church. Yes, the black church and the black pastor have come a mighty long way. But lest we get lost in the richness and vibrancy of our history, let us not forget the New Testament church is not made up of only black folk, but every nationality, ethnicity, and tongue on the earth. In this sense, the church is not any one people's church, but God's church. And the only qualification to be a member of this distinct and unique group we call the church is you got to be a sinner. You can't be a member if you're not a sinner. you got to be a sinner. Jesus said he would build this church. That the church would be assigned a mission to go ye there into the highways, preach and teach the gospel, seek and save that which is lost. Sinners would be saved and experience becoming a new creation. A new destination in eternity would be set for them in a name change. They would no longer be known as sinners, but saints. The church was established and laid forth for us a pattern that we ought to follow. In the book of Acts, we find that when they got saved after the day of Pentecost, that all the believers continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and the breaking of bread and prayer from house to house. Paul said it was a mystery that's now revealed, this body of Christ we call the church. Saints would receive gifts, and through these gifts, saints would demonstrate the manifest power of God through the edification of one another and being the light and salt of the earth. Now, without a doubt, it appears unquestionable and undeniably clear that God wants to do something with us. He did not save us that we might sit down and talk about being saved. He did not save us that we might hoard church positions to ourselves and say, I've been in a way for 50 years. And you're right, that's what you've been doing. You've been in the way for 50 years so nobody else can hold that position. He did not save us that we might fight against the pastor because he was not our choice at voting time. He saved us that he might use us to the glory of his name and the glory of his kingdom. It is in this vein of thought that the great apostle Paul writes to a young preacher named Timothy. If you have your Bibles, open them with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter number 2. 
And I'd like to read in your hearing from this second chapter of Paul's letter here to this young man and to the church at Ephesus. Beginning at verse number 20. I'm reading from the King James, and I ask that you follow along in whatever version it is, but we'll discuss it and move quickly. I was uh, nudged by one preacher that told me he, need us, he needed me to get us out here soon, so I'm going to do my best. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 20. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth and some to honor, and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from the yeast, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Verse number 22, flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. I would call your attention to that C section of verse number 21, where he says that in talking to Timothy, that if you do these things, meet these conditions, measure up to these challenges, you will be meet for the master's use. Meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. For just a moment tonight, I'd like you to thank with me and to pray with me as we speak from the thought of the subject, the instruments God uses. The instruments God used. I want to present to us that the first thing we need to consider as Paul writes to Timothy and he in turn reads it to the entire church that there's a need for the child of God to be prepared. There needs to be some preparation. Now you follow along with me because I'm going to teach from the Bible. Verse number 20 says, but in a great house, the Apostle Paul draws an analogy, if you will, and uses a metaphor of a great house, that the church, Timothy, is like a great house, like a mansion, he says. And in and, and this house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, important vessels, vessels, watch this, unto honor. And then he says some vessels which are not as regularly used, ordinary vessels. He used the term, which can be misleading, some to dishonor. But remember, Paul is writing to Timothy as he's left him there at Ephesus because they have been insaturated, if you will, with false teaching. And if you read 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, you'll find that the teachings of many of these false disciples and false teachers was permeating the church. And Timothy, youthful in age and youthful in the ministry, he needed someone to help gird up his loins that he could be strong. You know, sometimes it's hard to stand against a lie. Yeah, it's hard, you know, to sustain and have to stand by yourself. But he says this, 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 this church, Timothy, that you're pastoring now, it, it, it's, like, it's like a great house. And you got true teachers, Vessels of honor. And you got false teachers. Vessels of dishonor. Brothers and sisters, this idea, this concept, was before the time of Christ that the word of God had been being attacked by the devil. And he had sought to work through wicked men and wicked women by teaching them falsities in their beliefism about who, was, who God was and what God did. We remember in the garden how, how Satan came to the woman and said, yeah, did God really tell you you should not eat from that tree? What did he want to cast doubt to make us question God? That attacks our faith, our belief. We can't walk in the freedom of the grace that God has given us by faith when we're so busy trying to keep back the darts of the wicked. He says now, in that 15th verse further up, you remember he says to Timothy, he says, now I want you to study to show yourself approved. A workman unto God that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. To study means to prepare, to get yourself ready, because you're getting ready to deal with something. And we oftentimes, I remember preachers would tell me very early on in the message, you don't, you don't have to study, I just get up to the Holy Spirit to speak to you. 
If the Holy Spirit don't have nothing to put out, to pull out, if you ain't put nothing in, there's nothing he can speak. Then you get up and speak man's empty, futile words. And people come unchanged and they leave unchanged. And as a preacher, the first thing the word is to do, it's supposed to hit you. It's supposed to impact you. You to get buried in the word so that the word does something with you. We come oftentimes to church thinking we have to do something. No, we come so God can do something with us. God doesn't need church. We need church. He left this for us. We need each other. Amen. And the difference between, in this preparation between what the false teachers and the true teaching, teachers were teaching is a word we use all the time. It's called doctrine or the teaching of the church, the liturgical aspect. In the Greek, it's the word didactic that refers to instruction that is not only something that one believes, but something one lives. Yeah. And he said, now, Timothy, you're going to have to deal with this because they're going to come, and you're going to need to endure sound doctrine. Yeah. Hold on to your doctrine. I've taught you what you need to know. Don't be easily moved or shaken by what you hear these false teachers teaching. Yeah. May I submit to you this, this evening that these instruments of honor and dishonor, also suggests something else. It's not only the leaders of the church or the preacher of the church, but there can be false members in the church. Yeah, there can be true members of the church and false members of the church. You know, on Easter Sunday and Christmas, all kinds of people come in to the church, and they bring all kinds of attitudes and all kinds of spirits into the church. And I'm not talking about ghosts, but I'm talking about attitudes, the aura around them that they carry with them. They've been out there. They've been exposed to this. They've been listening to this one on the radio and visiting this one church, and they don't know what they uh, believe. And when people come in the church, a lot of times, there are people in the church who are saved. There are some people in the church who think they're saved. Uh -huh. There are some people in the church who pretend to be saved. But only God knows. Only they know. When you walk down the aisle and you cry and you feel sorry and walk back out there, no conversion has taken place. The Holy Spirit hasn't settled in your heart. If you haven't turned from your wicked ways, looking to God as the author and finish of your faith, you lead the same way you came. All kinds of people. And when people look for a church home, they, they look for, does the church uh, have a swinging choir? Does it have handsome men or beautiful women? Amen. Is it located on the thoroughfare out there on 17 where it can be seen and I could park my Cadillac right there so they'll know I'm, I attend this church. Is this pastor a great hooper? Does he shout and the people fall out and the windows crack and, and all that? Does, does he do all? They look. But do you know that the most important thing in finding a church home is doctrine? What does that church teach? What does that preacher preach? Somebody said, well, doctrine causes division. It's supposed to cause division because the seeking for, listen, argument for the sake of, of argument is sin, but argument for the sake of truth is righteousness. Paul told the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 11, where he spoke about the Lord's Supper, he says there needs to be divisions among you so the truth may be known. Then he turns over there to the Thessalonians in that fifth chapter, and he, and he tells them that, listen, test all things. You know, hold on to that which is good. If you don't judge what's good and what's bad and make a choice, how can you know what's good to hold on to? Huh? What about doctrine? What about it? It's important. You not only need to believe in Jesus, you need to believe the right thing about Jesus. Huh? The Jehovah's Witnesses say, hey, Jesus is just a created angel. No, he ain't. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the Mormons, Joseph Smith and them, they say he's the half-brother of Lucifer. No, he ain't. The Buddhists say, oh, he's just a good teacher to lead you to Nirvana. No, he's not. 
The, the Hindus say that, listen, he's just a great teacher and, and a good man, a good prophet. No, he's not. And the Muslims say, oh, he's just like Muhammad, you know. He's a man that is a great prophet, a good man. No, he's not. He is God the Son. And he is the Son of God. He is the Son of God on earth because he's the only begotten of the Father. Full of grace and full of truth. But he is God the Son, the second person of the Trinity. There's never been a time in eternity, past, present, or future, that he's never been the Son of God. It doesn't make him any less than the Father. That's why we say God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All three are God, one God, and three persons, co-eternal, co-sustained, co-existing, and what one does, they all do. There ain't no confusion. That's why we're called Trinitarians, because we don't believe one is one part God or one third God. No, he's one God. But three co-equal, distinct, substantive, eternal persons. God the Father required, sal sal uh, required payment for sin. God the Son said, I'll go and be a propitiation and meet your requirements. Only God could shed his blood to satisfy God's requirements. No man could satisfy God's requirements. And the Holy Spirit said, well, listen, if you're going to do your part, I'll do my part. I'll stay down there with them old rickety scoundrels. And I'll live in them. And I'll lead them and guide them. I'll pick their conscience. I'll tell them where they need to go. Doctrine is important. I'm going to move because I've got to get you out of here. But just watch how subtle it is. 1 Timothy chapter 3, sisters, no harm, don't, don't write no bad notes on my car, don't spray my car, anything. But in 1 Timothy 3, we're told that it's a good thing for a man to desire the office of a bishop. And that's the Greek word for man, the male of the species. And in case we're confused about what man that means, it ain't LGBT man, it ain't no gay man, okay? It's the man man, okay? And if we're not sure about what that is, look in the mirror. When you take off your clothes, you'll see if you're a man, man. Amen? But, he, but, 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 but we have to remember as we, uh, as we do that, that, uh, that if we confuse further down, it goes on to say the husband of one wife. Now that's a man. A man to be a pastor or a bishop or an elder. And all three terms refer to the same person. Well, a few years ago, we started finding out that women could pastor. Okay, I ain't trying to cause no trouble, sisters. I'm just talking about how we do the word of God. And we say, talk to people and say, well, you know, they could do it just as good as a man. I've seen some sisters and heard some sisters that could preach the church, preach us out of this church. But just because we can do something doesn't mean that we should do it. I can rob a bank, but I don't want to go to jail. And Lord, no, I need the money. But, but, and people give the excuse, well, it's the culture. We have to stay up with the times. Brothers and sisters, God's word is God's word. The Bible is to be read like any other book. You stop at period, you, you pause at commas. Huh? Colons introduce concepts to be expanded up on semicolons, list things that are going to give you another subject or another related subject to the first idea expressed by the grammatician. There's a problem with that. Why, why can't, why, listen, when the words make sense in sentences, sentences make sense in paragraphs. Paragraphs make sense in chapters. Chapters make sense in books. When the plain meaning of something you read makes sense, Seek no other sense, for all other sense is nonsense. Don't go looking for it. God said what he meant. A man. No, the country don't change God's word. God's word remained the same all the time. He's the immutable God. He know what's on the horizon. That's why he said what he said. So now we're told that, okay, women can pass. Okay. Now, today... You got LGBT people, pastors, in the church, kissing one another, 
have, look, brothers and sisters, I, I, I'm, I'm just telling you, we all are affected by it and impacted by it. But we need to know our doctrine. Cults like Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, they know their error better than we know our truth. That's because we want, as my brother says, stay in the word. Read the word. Don't let people tell you anything just because you heard. Look it up. Just like you with me tonight. Study. Go check behind Reverend White. See if what he's saying is true. You don't need nobody to help you go to hell. You can go there all by yourself. So now we got a rainbow Bible, a gay Bible, a LGB, where the word of God is just twisted to say that God loves everybody. That's true, God loves everybody, but he don't love your sin. And when you sin, God has to deal with giving you consequences because you're disobedient. He has not changed. I got to go. We got to go. So, so we need to have some preparation. Uh, as you look down through that text, you'll also find that he gives Timothy a condition in verse number 21. He says, now if a man therefore purge himself. Now we just dealt with uh, preparation. Let's look at this word purge. All, I'm just using all three words there in the text. It means to consecrate oneself, to distance oneself from the world. It, it, it means to empty yourself of all the stuff you got in you. And how many of us know if you keep going to the barber shop, you're going to eventually get a haircut? There's so much sin around us, Timothy, that you can't just stay around that. You got to distance yourself a little bit from that. John MacArthur it was that said, the moment we begin to desensitize ourselves to sin around us, we begin to desensitize ourselves to sin in us because that around us makes us feel good. We feel accepted. We feel a part of it. So we get lazy and say, I don't need to stop cussing. I don't need to stop uh, sneaking and playing the lottery. I don't need to stop doing that. But listen, you can fool people, but you can't fool God. And you can't fool yourself. You know you. You know what you do. You know what your issues are. You know what you need to overcome. And if you can't overcome them, which most of us cannot do, because every time people have this New Year's resolution, they go back and in losing 10, they gain 50 pounds. So, so that, that, that means that there has to be something more working in us, for us and through us, to give us the power to overcome. And sometimes we don't want to quit sin. Sin is good. Sin will make you go further than you want to go, stay longer than you want to stay, and you'll enjoy yourself dealing with sin. We have a propensity, a proclivity to sin, because we conceived in sin and born in this iniquity. It's there. We automatically want to sin. So we have to do what? Fight the good fight of faith. You got to put up a fight to overcome that thing, man. That thing ain't going to just leave you. You go get hypnotized all you want, take all the pills you want. When you wake up, you still sinning. We empty ourselves. First John tells us in this purging, it, it, it love not the world. And, 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 and what it means is for you to get to decide for yourself, Timothy, that you can't be a part of this. It sounds good. You go to these churches, they got the ATMs back here, oh, they're rocking and rolling, and they have a good time, and the preacher preach, and they leave out and say, oh, my God, didn't that man preach today? Yeah, he preached. What did he preach about? I don't know, but he sure preached. He preached. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, Church is a time for learning. It's a time for you being educated. The devil's not going to run from music, brother, no, no, no pun intended. He's not going to run from, from music. He's not going to run from programs and chicken dinners and all this fellowshipping. But he will leave you when you give him the word of the living God. He can't handle that. But you can't give it if you don't know it. And the only way you're going to know it, you need to come to Bible study. You need to come and uh, uh, hear a teaching pastor teach and learn the word of God. Yeah. We're talking, if you will, here. There are 27 books in the New Testament. Four of them are the Synoptic Gospels. That leaves 24. You have that 24, half of them, 12 of them, all contain uh, uh, instructions and warnings about false doctrine, about false teachers. 
It's not new. There's nothing new under the sun when it comes to this. The devil is still working. Luke addresses it in the book of Acts. Paul addresses it in his general epistles. Peter addresses it. I mean, it's all over the New Testament. It must be something God wants us to learn. And in Jesus, in chapter 24, when he was talking to the disciples about tearing down and building up and what the world was going to be, he spends the first few verses talking about beware of false prophets. Beware. And when people came to me and they were asking me about Benny Hinn, I, of course, say, well, we'll show that to me in the Bible. Ain't nowhere in the Bible nobody blowing on nobody. And somebody might say, well, Pastor, you shouldn't really speak that way about it. Well, I'm going to show you what the Bible says. He tells them after verse 15 and verse 16 of that same chapter, he says, Timothy, shun profane and vain babbling, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom Hymenaeus and Philetus, they have erred. They have, con they have erred concerning the truth because they're saying the resurrection is already past. And what does it do? It overthrew the faith of some because they left the church because they felt they missed the resurrection. Paul called their names. How can people know how to avoid false uh, teaching if you don't know who's teaching it? You got to know who they are. When they came up with this name it and claim it and putting something on the wall and they're going to claim this and I don't want this gift. I want to speak in tongues and all that. That's not biblical. Who knows better what gift to give you than the Holy Spirit? What makes you think you got a better idea about the gift you deserve or that you need but the Holy Spirit who is God? And don't tell me don't claim I got a code. I got a code. I'm sniffing and snotting all over you and you telling me don't claim it. I don't need to claim it. It didn't claim me. So, so Paul tells Timothy to prepare. Then he tells him to purge himself. But then he says, now, now, now Timothy, these are conditions. Remember we're saying that you want to be an instrument used of God. So he says down in that 21st verse, uh, uh, I'm sorry, in that 22nd verse, at the bottom of it, at the last section, he says, this is for them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Yeah. Timothy, got to have a pure heart. Yeah. It doesn't mean you need to be sinless or that you need to be perfect. For God, you know, in his communicable attributes as he's given them to us, we, we're allowed to imitate him and emulate him in some ways because if he's pure, which means unclean, I mean clean, untainted, there's nothing about God that could look towards sin or wickedness or anything dirty. He's God and he's pure. His word is pure. And you remember David in 51 of, 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 of the Psalms? He says, Lord, create in me a clean heart. That word clean in the Hebrew is the same word as pure. It's a, it, it's a word that suggests, and, and, and then we saw in John, if you remember John, when Jesus was calling the disciples, he looked and he saw Nathaniel, and he said, behold, a man in whom there is no guile. That's the same word in the Greek. God means that you don't have no underhand uh, intentions to do nothing, that you're not deceitful, that there's no trickery in you. You're just a person that calls straight up A to B, just like it is. And that's the way God is. And that's what he's saying, Timothy, you can't compromise with this thing. You got to get your heart right, Timothy. If you want to be meat for the master's use, if you want to be an instrument in the hand of God, you got to get and meet these conditions. You got to get prepared. You got to purge yourself. And you got to work on your heart, Timothy. Because as a man thinketh in his heart, Timothy, so is he. So if you keep fraternizing with this and giving compromise to that and saying, well, maybe God want me to do this. No, Timothy. I know what Lois, your grandmother and your mother, Lois, or Eunice put in you. I called you into the God. I laid my hands on you. I taught you every, and you do not stray from what you have learned. We are so many of us throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Our forefathers couldn't read and write, but yet they pinched their pennies and they gave what they could to the future for schools that they'll never walk in the halls of, for a Howard University, for a Morehouse, for a Clark. They laid forth with what they had. We today, have so much nerve, we can do less with the more that we make than they did with the little that they made. There's something wrong with this picture. Where are we? Are we struggling to be pure in heart, as Jesus said in, in, in the Sermon on the Mount? 
Well, what kind of lives are we living? Lord, I'm going to go to my seat. But I want tonight for us to be aware so we can pass the word. We need to know in some doctrine. Sure, it's going to cause divisions, but you stand on the word. When you stand for truth, God stands with you because he is truth. Huh? He is truth. And then when you stand for righteousness and truth, the world may not stand with you. You may feel all alone, but God is there with you. Just stand for the truth. You may not be able to have a big church with a bunch of people. But remember, God don't count numbers. He makes numbers count. If you just got a few people in there that love the Lord, God can do something with that few. It'd be better than you having a bunch of people in there. None of them ain't saved. They live in it. You're going to stay at the jailhouse and stay down at the mall. You ain't going to never get no sleep, Pastor Rocket. Sister Joanne is going to want a divorce because you ain't never home. Because you're just compromising to just make the church be big with a lot of people. A lot of people is, that don't mean God is there. Amen? I'm going to close. I'm going to go and sit down. But I want to be sure that we understood. There are three things that destroy Christians. It affects their testimony. It makes them weak in their faith. And unless they uh, recognize it and begin to work on it, they're going to have a problem. The first is ignorance. You don't know. But you ought to go find out. We're no longer stuck with just using an encyclopedia. Just go in there to the laptop and go on the internet. And you can get all the information you need. A second thing that destroys Christians is neglect. You know to do, but you just don't do. Huh? We call that laziness and complacency. And a third thing that destroys Christians is indulgence. Huh? You go above and beyond. You decide you're going to frustrate the grace of God by just saying, well, I'm going to do this this one time. And before you know it, uh, you're taking another drink the next day. And before you know it, that thing which started out as a social indulgence has now become a habit. You no longer have it. It now has you. And now you got to ask God, to help you let it go. Do I have a witness? Yes, for 148 years, God has placed his hand of blessing upon Mount Nebo. Huh? God has used Mount Nebo as an instrument for 148 years. Then decided within the span of 23 years to send them a pastor named Rocky Smith. Huh? I think God knows what he's doing. There ain't no shortcoming in God. He'll always do just what he promised. He tells us if we will in this purpose of maintaining this church for all these years. We show to the world that God is real and that our Savior lived. And according to God's word. We see him work out, if you will, a plan in the lives of the men that he has called. He touched the life of one Rodney Smith and sent him to be an instrument to be used on a sign. No doubt, Mount Nebo, you've seen some rough times. And no doubt, you've seen some troubled times. But I just stopped by this evening to tell you that God is faithful as promised. Yeah. That God will do just what he said he'll do. If you can just hang on a little longer and know that God's going to work it out in his time. As I go to my seat, I'm, I'm finished. But I want to show you, if you will, this is nothing but a simple tool bag. But according to Paul, it's a great house. And in it, we have some instruments. 
We have a hammer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we, we got some grip ply. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we got a, a Phillip and a straight head screwdriver. I, I want to say to you that these can easily represent the members of a church. Instruments that God wants to use. I want to tell you something about these instruments. I'm listening, but I, I don't hear no fussing in there. I don't hear nobody complaining. I don't hear nobody saying uh, that they should have four lights in the sanctuary and that the carpet ought to be green. Another thing I noticed about these instruments is I can leave them and I can come back and they're still there. They ain't went over to join another church because they didn't like the pastor because they thought the pastor was preaching their business. There's another thing about these instruments, brothers and sisters. They don't complain. And we all know that Joseph was a carpenter. And he taught Jesus at an early age how to work with wood. And every now and then, uh, the master who is in heaven, he reaches down into this bag. And he pulls up a tool for a specific duty. And if you notice, if you will, uh, that the hammer is not trying to sing in the choir. It's not standing at the back door. It's a bodacious fellow. It's made for driving things. It's made for pulling things. He's a rough guy. He, he might be a deacon or an elder, but you, you might find sometimes, too, that you might have a, 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 a Phillips screwdriver might be an usher. They got four sides to it. They can deal with any guy, a person that comes to the door. They could smile on this side, frown on that side, walk them down the aisle on this side, tell them to get up and bring us some tissue when they're crying and falling out on that side. What I'm trying to illustrate to you, brothers and sisters, is that God knows what he's doing. And each of us are instruments that God has called. And when he decides to use us, they don't complain. They work together. And when, they, when the hammer sees the screwdriver being used, he's comfortable with that. Because he knows God got a blessing and a place for him. We are designed differently. And each one of us has a specific role that God has called us for. He ain't forgot about you. He ain't forgot about me. Our job is to be ready when the master calls. When he reaches down in here. Are you ready to work? Are you ready to do God's will? There were those that came before us years and years ago whose names we don't even know. They sacrificed and they waited and let God use them so that you could make 148 years. You didn't just get here by happenstance. You didn't just get here by luck. God had a plan and God worked it out. This was plan. He's a God of a plan. And he's a God of a purpose. And he's a God, if he makes a promise, he shall bring it to pass. Be an instrument, Mount Nebo. Be an instrument, Pastor. Let God use you. And we pray that God will bless you with many, many more years. Amen. Our hearts are turned heavenward as we pray that, Lord, you were pleased with how we shared and preached your word and how your people said amen. Now we extend the invitation that if you've heard the word of God and the, God, the word of God has touched your heart, impacted your mind, made you sense and know that he's real, then I want to extend the invitation to you now. Uh, if you are here tonight and you've never accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, we invite you to do so now. There are things that God would reveal to you once you get saved and as you learn and begin to grow in the things of God. Your faith will become sure-footed as you walk into the grace of God. Change your eternal destination now by making a choice for Christ. Take out fire insurance right now. Because if you don't choose he heaven, hell's going to choose you. Is there one? Is there anyone? Eternity is too long. 
And hell is too hot for you to take a chance with this thing. Last but not least, if you're here and you know the Lord by Christian experience, we invite you to consider joining church here at this wonderful ministry. A great pastor, great men and women of God. Every Christian should have a church home. Somewhere you can learn, somewhere you can grow, somewhere you can serve, and somewhere you can love and receive love in return. Remember, you may respond to any of these invitations at any time. But I caution you, as I hear the word of God say, if you are ashamed to profess me before men, I will be ashamed to profess you before my Father, which is in heaven. God bless you and keep you. Pastor. Yes, he will. Won't he do it? Y'all remember that? I know the Lord will make a way. Yes, he will. Oh, yes, he will. Won't he do it? I know the Lord. Yeah, yes, it will. Well, he'll make a way for you and for you. He will see you safely through. I know the Lord will make a way. Yes, He will. You remember the old folk used to come along and say, Yes, He will. Yes, He will. I know he will. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. Well, yes, he will. Oh, yes, he will. Well, he'll make a way for you and for me. The Lord will see you safely through I know the Lord you'll make a way let's give God praise praise God for the preacher amen amen preacher 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 may have shaken up some things around here, but, but, but uh, you remember the church of Berea? They went home and opened up the word to make sure what the preacher said was true. Isn't that right? Amen. Thank you, Reverend White. Amen. Bless you, man. We, we praise you for allowing the Lord to use you in such a magnificent way. Amen. 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 Again, we thank all of you. Thank our, um, our audiovisual, IT ministry, and, and thank all of our visitors and friends. And, and we thank Mount Nebo Baptist Church. Amen. 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 I'm not going to hold us up. Amen. Pastor White has come down. Um, um, and again, we thank you, <laughs> Reverend Newman and the Newmans. Amen. Amen. I know they got to go to school in the morning, too, but I tell you what, they, they thought it not robbery that they come out and worship with us tonight. Amen. 
Amen. God bless you all. Uh, be careful going out. Uh, lion, tigers, and bears. <laughs> Amen. I haven't seen I haven't seen any of them, but I heard that they're out here. Amen. Twenty three years I have yet to see a bear. Amen. But they say they say they out here. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. We praise you, uh, Reverend White. If you will come and give the benediction. Amen. Oh, it's being recorded. Okay. Thank you so much for your attendance tonight. Uh, I pray that you have been blessed, have been moved, and have, have just been spiritually uplifted, uh, especially as it relates to knowledge. You know, the Bible tells us our, that God says his people are destroyed, not for a lack of emotion, but for a lack of knowledge. And I, that means that when you know better, God expects you to do better. And we don't always do it, but it's expected. Amen. Thanks again to this pastor and to my preaching brethren and to all of you for uh, just listening for a moment. Amen. Amen. Let us bow our heads and look to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious and eternal God, I ought to turn heavenward once again, Lord, as we prepare to depart this place, but not your presence. Keep us, Lord God, as the apple of your eye. Hold us in the hollow of your hand until it's time we meet again. And every believer responded by saying amen, 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 amen. and amen. amen.